Hey everybody, uh, welcome back. Here we are today celebrating Father's Day as it's Father's Day weekend. Uh, of course, Father's Day, you know, not necessarily a biblical day, but definitely uh, honorable as we are called to honor our fathers and mothers. Uh, the sermon is entitled, The Good Father. Scripture today you'll see is coming out of Psalms 103, uh, verses 8 through 18. Uh, I'll read them all together and then we bounce them around. You'll see them on the screen as well. Um, but today, we're going to be talking about some statistics. It's actually something I've preached on in the past, so if you've heard it, uh, they're not new stats or ones I've pulled up that I've had. Uh, but I feel like they're important as there is a little bit new presence out there, and perhaps you haven't heard some of these numbers. So, according to LifeWay Research Group, Father's Day is on average the lowest church attendance it is statistically lower than Labor Day, Memorial Day, and even the 4th of July. Do you hear that? So Father's Day, statistically the lowest day in church attendance. You want empty pews, you want plenty of space to come, show up on Father's Day. Now you flip that around to Mother's Day, if you go back and see uh, my Mother's Day sermon, you're going to see that Mother's Day rates up there, it hovers around number two or three. All right, it's right up there with, with Easter. That's the contrast, the difference. Mother's Day is the most highly uh, attended Sundays of the year in the top three. And Father's Day is the lowest. Now, of course, there's a lot of things that go into these numbers. It could be just the timing. In Mother's Day, kids are still in school and um, it, it feels good for moms to have their kids there. There's affirmation, there's praise at church. Um, and then you get to Father's Day and it suddenly doesn't seem like it's as important or it's in June, you know, people are on vacation. Uh, in my instance, you know, even on Father's Day, my own dad was actually making hay. Uh, we farm. So, uh, those things do happen. Um, but when you see a drastic jump, that's top three to bottom three, there's more going on than just the time. So though those numbers are so drastic, they might not be if the times were changed, there's still going to be a separation. Father's Day is just not a day that men are in church with their children. Now, I want to tell you how important it is for men to be in the pews. I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, guys, if you are watching this and you're not in church with your kids and you're not reading the word, you're not showing them a godly lifestyle, you are failing our nation and you are failing your children. I, there's really no nice way to say it. You are called as a spiritual leader of your household. When I do marriage advice, I talk to the couples and I talk to the husband. I say, are you ready to take on the responsibility? And they go, well, what do you mean? Yeah, I, you know, I can be a husband. No, no, no. I'm like, you now have the spiritual welfare of your family. Listen to these statistics. Um, these, uh, this is data collected by Promise Keepers. Um, it's a little bit old, I believe. These stats are from 2016, but you're still gonna get the point of it. <clears throat> if a father does not go to church, and even if his wife does, okay, so no dad goes to church, but the mom does, the wife does, only one in 50 children of those situations will end up regularly attending church as they grow up. Do you hear that? So even if mom goes to church, but dad doesn't, one out of 50 kids when they grow up will go to church. Now, of course, all these statistics, there are exceptions, but the numbers give you a good uh, baseline of what ends up happening. Now listen to this one. If the father does go regularly, regardless of what the mother does. Okay, so dad goes all the time. Doesn't matter if mom does or doesn't. That number goes from one to 50 to two thirds. So about 27, 30, no, we're probably actually, my math ain't very good, about 32. 32 out of 50, because dad went to church. Now, if the father attends irregularly, between two thirds will still go. Do you see that? Dads, your importance, 
Your kids need to see that you belong in church. Your sons idolize you. They look at you. They say, how should I live my life? Subconsciously, they're doing it, of course. Yeah, you know, when they become a man, they're going to look back and say, wow, was my dad in church? Oh, dad never went to church. Well, I'm not taking my kids there. Listen to this survey. This is another one. Um, and this one is very stark, very duress, uh contradictions here. Listen to this survey. This survey found that if a child is the first person in the household to become a Christian, okay, so you got mom, dad, and three, four kids. If one kid becomes a Christian, then goes to church and tries to take his family, only 3.5% of families, because the child was the first Christian, comes into church and then becomes Christians. 3.5. Now, let's say that it's mom. Mom becomes a Christian, starts coming into church, and she's dragging her family along with her. 17% chance. All right, so that's better than 3.5, up to 17%. Now listen to this huge difference. We go from 17% if mom is the leader, the first to become a Christian to lead the family. Now if it's dad, that number doesn't jump to 50%. It doesn't go to 60, it doesn't go to 70, 80, or 90. It goes to a 93% chance that if the dad leads the family to church, 93% of the households, the probability is they will follow and they will, res they will keep going to church as they become older. Guys, if you're listening to this, I'm throwing the gauntlet down. Look at church attendance across the nation. Look at our morals as a nation. You know, I've preached and saying part of the problem is uh, God is taken out of the schools. He's not being taught there anymore. God's not allowed in the schools, so children don't realize they need it. Well, guess what? Dads, you're failing at home. You are not a spiritual leader in your household. And that just snowballs into our society. You don't get your butt to church. Your kids don't get their butt to church. You know, we crumble. Morality is lost. Guys, homes need fathers. Fathers need churches. So they know how to become a good father. Our nation is going in the direction it is because our fathers aren't manning up and being the men that they are supposed to be. Now, women, if you're watching this, um, I don't, you know, I don't know who, of course, is watching this right now as I speak this. I don't know where you're at in your life, but maybe you say, "Well, I don't have a good dad in my life. My ex or my husband's a deadbeat." Well, that's yesterday. Now you move forward. Quit going after deadbeats. Quit following after men that don't have a relationship with Christ. You can't do the same thing over and over and expect different results. I'm going to tell you kind of some of my personal issues, okay? You know, I'm a preacher, uh, married to my wife, should be this amazing, great dad, right? No, I fail left and right. I'm preparing for this sermon. I'm reading through Psalms 103, 8 through 18. And it's like I get a two by four to the head. God's saying, dude, this is you. You're screwing up. You're failing. So let me throw my heart out there as a father. As I read this scripture and I show you my shortcomings, you will see the importance as a father that you need to get your butt to church. You need to get your butt into the word so you can see where you're failing your kids. So here's the word of the Lord today. Psalms 103, 8 through 18, New Living Translation, starting at verse 8. It says, The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. For our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and we die. The wind blows and we are gone as though we had never been there. But the love of the Lord remains forever. 
with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children of those who are faithful to his covenant and to those who obey his commands. The Lord had a blessing, the reading of his word. Now, why did I say I felt like I was getting slapped upside the head with a two by four as I was reading this scripture? Because that's what the word of the Lord does. It convicts us. It's that two-edged sword that cuts both ways in and out. said the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Let me tell you what's just been going on. I just got back from a junior high mission trip, uh, led a bunch of kids, so I've been gone for three days, and you all know this about me, we farm. So I left a, a lot for my children to do that were still at home. I have a 14-year-old and 10-year-old. Uh, we're home, and they had to take care of all the calves, the pigs, the chickens. You know, we got a ton of stuff at our place. And I asked him, I said, did you feed all of the animals? Yep. So did you feed the calves? Yep. Every day. I said, did you water the chicks? We got chicks and chickens. Yep. We watered them. Three days. I had four chicks die because they didn't get watered enough. I had one calf because he's not in the hutches by the other ones. Didn't get any grain for three days. He got milk, so he's all right. But he didn't get any grain for three days. I did chores late that night because I got home later in the day. I came in, and I went up to uh, tell my 10-year-old, you know, good night. And instead, I unloaded on him. I'm like, I gave you this responsibility. You told me it was done. Kind of lost it. Verse 8 says, The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. Verse 9 says, He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. I was just accusing and accusing. I blew up on my 14 year old. I lost it on Job. I was launching buckets. I'm like, Dude, I counted on you and you failed. Here I am reading this scripture, and God's like, Dude, what do you think I deal with with you? And yet God shows me compassion and mercy. He's slow to get angry with me. I was quick to get angry with my children. How are my children going to see the love of a good father when I can't show it to them? So this is why, dads, this is why you got to get in the Bible. Why you got to get your butt in church. So God can correct you. So he can discipline you. So he can change you. So that you can show your children what a good and loving father is. You know, I wanted to throw my kids under the bus and just go after them for every little thing that they did. I got like 20 calves on milk. I got 100 and some chickens. We got hogs. We got goats. Uh, we got a ton of cows. Not a ton of cows. We got about 15 cows pasture at two different places. I was gone for three days. I left it to a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old. Okay, they made a few mistakes. All in all, they did pretty awesome. I need to learn, like my last sermon, to show a little grace and to give a little grace to my own kids. And verse 10 says that he does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. Man, how are my kids going to know the love of a dad if all I do is punish and harsh and harsh? It's not who God is to us. So why should I be that to them? Now, I do throw that caveat into my children that it does say it doesn't punish us for all of our sins if they mess up. There is that healthy fear of dad. There's an old comedian I heard one time. He was talking about, I don't even know who it was, but he was talking about the fear of dad. And he goes, well, my buddies would tell me to do something that was a terrible idea. I'd look at him and be like, no way. If I do that, my dad's going to kill me. You know, it was kind of a joke. He's like, that fear of dad, my dad will kick my butt. There's this level of fear of dad that is healthy and good. But we have to have the wisdom as dad and it's something I struggle with. Uh, in my place, I am kind of a hammer. I, I try to run a tight ship and uh, we have to find that healthy fear of dad where they realize if they mess up, dad's gonna be mad. But what they need to see is it's not dad is mad at them because of what they did to dad but dad is mad at them for what they did to themselves when they screw up. 
That is how we as fathers need to look at God. We need to have that heavenly fear of God, the one of respect, of reverence, and that, okay, I have to answer to you. And then our kids need to see that, that even though God's unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as heights is from the heaven to the earth, he doesn't punish us the way he should. He gives us mercy. And he's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. It says the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. So that fear is healthy and good. But we also need to be tender and compassionate. Now, this uh, I was told you a little bit about this junior high trip that we just did this week. We took some 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, uh, a great group of kids uh, from all over, not just uh, Mount Hope, Wazika. Uh, we had a bunch of other churches chime in, ecumenical event. And uh, I would call around and schedule jobs with different municipalities and cities. And as I called around to them, I said, hey, I said, I got some youth that are willing to do some work. You know, maybe you want some painting, landscaping, stuff like that done. I go, but listen. If you want them to do some work, you're getting 6th graders, 7th graders, and 8th graders. And if you want painting done, know that you are getting free painting jobs from 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. So you're not going to get professional quality. Now we had one minor issue, and, and I don't even think it was a big issue. Um, I just kind of heard about it, wasn't even part of it, so I think it was handled and dealt with, where uh, some paint did get... Uh, on the wrong spot, um, wind caught it, blue paint all over, and then the kids did splatter paint everywhere where it shouldn't be. And one adult had an issue with this. And another adult said, no, you're dealing with sixth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders, what do you expect? Now we can look at kids, and if we want our house painted, we wouldn't go to a whole bunch of 10, 10 year olds and be like, hey, I need you to paint my house and then be mad when it looked like crap. We would expect it. Now follow me here. Good painters, if you want a professional, you want someone to come in, you're gonna pay for their years of experience. How did those good painters get so good? By years of making bad choices and finding out what doesn't work and what does. So it's when it says in uh, verse 14 here, when God looks at us and he says, for he knows how weak we are, he remembers we are only but dust. What this is saying, he remembers that we are far from him, we're far from perfect. And we are learning day in and day out from our mistakes. I heard this uh, example, nothing like doing a, a sermon analogy by the pastor listening to another sermon who heard it from another guy. All right, so this is a story of uh, um, Dr. Jer David Jeremiah, was given a sermon and he used Billy Graham and his daughter's story. So it's Lance Wetter talking about two other preachers. Um, but anyway, this is the story that I heard and I hope it's right. I was riding in the car listening, so I didn't write it down. So if I get it wrong, my bad, but I don't think uh, any of the Grahams or Dr. David Jeremiah is listening to me. But anyway, um, this is the story. Uh, Billy Graham's daughter, uh, had had a car accident. She was driving too fast, kind of down a mountainside, and slammed into their neighbor's car. And I had heard um, that she was very scared, as any teenager would be after their first accident, to go home and tell dad. So she kind of waited and put it off as long as she could. And then finally that night, she came into the house, and she saw her dad standing there, uh, Billy Graham. And she didn't... Uh, she didn't want to look him in the eye. She didn't know what to do. And finally, it just she broke. She ran over, threw her arms around her dad and said, Dad, I'm so sorry. I crashed the car. I hit the neighbor. And the four things that he told her, and I'm paraphrasing is I didn't write these down. But the four things he told her was one, he said, I already knew about the accident because the neighbor came right up the hill to tell me all about it. Two, I was waiting for you to tell me. Three, the car is just stuff. We can fix it. And four, you'll be a better driver because you're going to learn from your mistakes. God looks at us. He knows we are weak. He remembers that we are dust. And he knows that we are going to make mistakes. 
He knows the mistake we have made even before we say it. He's longing to hear us come to him and say, Dad, I'm so sorry I messed up. And then he looks at us and says, yeah, you did. Now learn from it and don't do it again. Fathers, we have to be that type of dad to our own kids. I struggle with this. Some of you might as well. This is why we need the word of the Lord. This is why we need church to build us up, to give us the wisdom. So the next time our kids do something stupid, we remember this verse and remember that that's how God feels with us. He deals with us mercifully, so we need to deal with our own children mercifully as well. This scripture is hard to live. It's hard to be a dad. But we need to install this love into our children. You know, one of the reasons I think, and this is a small reason, but a uh, minor reason, I think here in Wisconsin we have a free fishing day over Father's Day weekend. And a lot of the dads are going on fishing trips or taking their kids out and they're camping. And because we want to make those memories, we want to be that good dad. Well, let me say this to you as a father. Do you want to protect your kids? Because if you want to protect the kids, if you want to make memories with them, get their butts back in church. You sit in the pew right with them because all the memories you make with them now, if they end up in hell, they won't remember a single one of them. Your responsibility as a father, as a spiritual leader, is to lead them to the cross, to show them the love of a father, to show them the love of the son who would submit to the father's will so that as they grow and mature with age, they will see that they need Jesus Christ. All the memories you're making with them, cast in line, they're great. I encourage you to do it. But do it after church. Do it on Saturday. You know what? Maybe take a vacation day and show them during the week that your kids are worth more to them than your job. But leave Sunday alone. Dads, I'm challenging you. I'm throwing it down. Get your butt back in church and bring your kids with you. Watch the difference that it will make in our nation and in our household and in our family if our men start leading their families back to the cross so that we all look upon Jesus and he changes us from the inside so that we change everything around us. Dads, happy Father's Day and get your butt back to church. Hope to see you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, I thank you for your scripture, uh, for how you, you remind us as a father um, that we need to be slow to anger. We need to show our children compassion. And we need to teach and train them in a way that is right so as they age, they will not depart from it. Lord, my prayer now is for the dads out there that they rise up and be the man that you have created them to be. And they take on the responsibility of getting their children, getting their wives, their entire family back in church and back into the word. Lord, it's all in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a good week. And don't forget to uh, give a little grace this week. See ya.